Rory Stewart. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a great privilege to, to follow the Honourable Member from Barrow, who gave an extremely eloquent, entertaining and serious speech. I could try to speak quite briefly. I think the great challenge here is trying to work out, after nearly 60, 70 years of this debate, what there is new to say. These big issues, huge ethical issues which have been raised on the other side, huge strategic issues which have been raised on this side, have been gone through again and again. The one thing, though, that perhaps we should say at the beginning of the 21st century is certain kinds of arguments should no longer be relevant. I want to begin by saying that the first argument that I don't believe we should be having is fundamentally an argument about economics. This is a huge question. It's pointed out by honourable members opposite. This is a question of Armageddon. This is a question of deep, deep strategy. This is the fifth largest economy in the world. We should not be making the decision whether or not to keep nuclear weapons on the basis of either the belief that we could save some money by cutting them or alternatively the belief that we should be retaining them in order to keep some jobs in a marginal constituency. It is much more important than that. What can we say? Well, the first thing that we notice is that the nature of deterrence and the threats that we're facing have changed. The threats that we're facing now, particularly posed by Russia and Ukraine, which everybody have raised again and again, are not exactly the same as the kinds of threats raised by the Soviet Union. Say absolutely straight out, I will be voting in favour of the retention of the Trident nuclear deterrent. It's a very, very important thing for us to do. But I have enormous respect for the people on the other side of the House who have anxieties about it, and it is to them that I want to address a few short remarks. The history of the last 30 years unfortunately has shown that the kind of arguments made by people in favour of nuclear disarmament in the end, although well-intentioned, although frequently led by impressive intellectuals, bishops, scholars, were proved wrong. In the end, it turned out to be that the people who were characterised as Dr. Strangelove, the people who were written off as being irrational and macho, turned out to have a better understanding of the mentality of Stalin, a better idea about how to protect Western Europe, and indeed should be thanked for the work that they did which contributed in no small way to ensuring that today we have had 70 years of the greatest and most productive and prosperous period of peace in Europe conceivable. We should also thank the Labour Party for their contribution to the setting up of NATO and the commitment that they made to the nuclear deterrent since the Second World War. We should continue to work together on this. But the threat that we now face is a different one. We don't know what Putin is doing. And before we decide how to deter him, we need to work out what that threat is. Is he intending to use nuclear weapons? We notice, for example, that he has been investing heavily in his tactical nuclear arsenal. He's also committed a great deal of money towards modernizing his nuclear arsenal. He's been running recent exercises, including the deployment of a nuclear bomber to Venezuela. At the same time, the activities which he's engaged in and which his chief of staff is laying out, Gerasimov is laying out, is all arranged around the idea of ambiguous warfare, almost at the very opposite end of the spectrum from nuclear war. The use of special forces, the use of intelligence operatives, the use of cyber warfare to create a situation now where we have in Donetsk where he continues to be able to try to claim deniability while putting Russian special forces and Russian weapons in on the ground. And the question for us in coming up with a deterrent is how do we deal with that threat? What does the United States do to protect NATO? What is the United Kingdom prepared to do to protect NATO? One of the things I'm not quite clear about listening to this debate, and I'd be interested to see what the, the shadow spokesman is going to say on this, is what is Britain proposing to do if Russia were to attack a Baltic state with our nuclear weapons. We knew what we were proposing to do in the 1980s. The basic concept of the tripwire was that we had forces on the ground and that were the Soviet Union to attack those forces, nuclear weapons would be fired at Moscow. In this debate, there now seems to be some ambiguity. Are British nuclear weapons used only to defend British soil 
or would they be used to defend the Baltic? Okay, I'm going to give way. Yeah, thank you. Wait, I mean, isn't the question, what will America do if uh, there's an attack on the Baltic states from Russia? And our involvement in this is a periphery. We don't provide a deterrent. America does. And what we're doing is clinging to this... Uh, this uh, virility symbol as a gesture of our own national pride when it's not relevant and the whole point of multilateral disarmament was to reduce the number of nations down to two that have nuclear weapons and by possessing them we're encouraging other nations to acquire them. Uh, the Honourable Member makes a very good point but I, I think the fundamental nature of our disagreement is going to be about our whole relationship to the NATO structure and the kind of role we wish to play within it. I suspect that the Honourable Member, although he's speaking very eloquently about nuclear weapons, would also disagree with many of us on this side of the House about conventional weapons too and the role that we generally play in protecting countries like the Baltic State against attacks from Russia. And if the Honourable Member wishes to intervene again, I'd be very interested in hearing what he proposes Britain should do to defend the Baltic States against such an attack. Uh, I know the Baltic States very well. I've visited them four times in the 80s and 90s. What I'd, today, what I'd suggest is what we do is not pretend the, there's some fantasy nuclear war going to take a pace with us as the uh, main participants. Where we've been successful is in humanitarian interventions in places like East Timor and in uh, Sierra Leone. Where we failed is when we've gone into Iraq and Afghanistan with all guns blazing. The area we're good at is humanitarian intervention. That's where our money should be invested. With respect, as I say, suspected, the Honourable Member is focused on issues like East Timor and humanitarian intervention, which have very little to do with the question of NATO. This whole idea of an attack on one is an attack on all is fundamentally predicated on the idea of deterrence. It's fundamentally predicated on the idea that we, the United Kingdom, as a major member of NATO, would protect these states if they were attacked. And my suspicion is that the Honourable Member has no strategy whatsoever on how to defend them. Giving up on the nuclear weapon is simply a symbol from the Honourable Member, a virility symbol perhaps, of actually giving up in general on our obligations to protecting NATO states. If I've misunderstood, I'm very happy to take an intervention again. Is, is very, very generous in this. But I could say, if, you, if we went to Tallinn or, or Vilnius and asked them who they looked to defend them, if Russia attacked, they looked to America, not to us. So, that, of course, we can agree with the Honourable Member on, right? That is true. One of the questions is working out what Britain's going to do. The biggest question, of course, for Vladimir Putin is what is the United States going to do? But the reason why these questions are relevant and the uncertainty around these questions are relevant is that Vladimir Putin's own decisions, his decision on whether to use ambiguous warfare, whether to use conventional troops, or whether to use nuclear weapons, will be guided by his perception of what we, the United States, or Britain, are likely to do in response. I give way. Uh, does my, right, my honourable friend agree with me that the whole point of Article 5 is not a question of which uh, of the members of NATO will an attacked country look to to get most military help? It is to take any uncertainty out of the question of who will declare war if a NATO country is, a, is attacked. And therefore, if a NATO country is attacked, our existing obligations are to declare war on the attacker. Doesn't that mean that we must be very careful, in fact, how widely we extend NATO membership? I agree absolutely uh, with the Honourable Member. This is a very, very important point. This obligation, this NATO obligation, is an unbelievably serious and important obligation. We've stretched it absolutely to its breaking point. If we're going to be serious about it, we have to follow through, and that indeed it absolutely means that we should not be giving guarantees to people that we have no intention of protecting. We shouldn't be writing checks that we're not prepared to have cashed. But the nub of this issue, the nub of this issue is, of course, that deterrence depends not on whether or not Britain would use a nuclear weapon. It depends on whether or not the other side believes we would use the nuclear weapon. And therefore, the most important support for our nuclear warheads is not the Trident missiles or even the submarines. The most important support for our nuclear warheads is the character of our nation, which is why there is absolutely no point us having a discussion about a nuclear deterrent without looking at our defence strategy and posture in general. 
Deterrence cannot make sense. We cannot get ourselves into a situation which I sometimes worry that my honourable friend is getting himself into, where we believe simply investing in fancy bits of kit is going to keep us safe. Because if people don't believe that we're going to use them, that we're serious about using them, they will be entirely meaningless. And we can see the problems already. So let's just run through the various justifications that have been laid out here for nuclear weapons. The first was P5 membership. The big question for Britain on P5 membership is, are we serious about our role in the United Nations at all? Why are we not contributing more to UN peacekeeping? Let's talk about Iraq. People have raised Iraq. The big question on Iraq is not us posturing about caring about terrorism or saying it's a tier one threat. What are we actually doing? At the moment on the ground outside Kurdistan, while Australia has 300 soldiers, Italy and Spain are deploying 300, we have exactly three. This means that Britain is not displaying and demonstrating consistently seriousness. We're not in a position, this isn't about combat troops, this is about being able to analyze the mission, being able to have an intelligent conversation with the Iraqi government, being able to engage with our coalition allies, being able to play the kind of global role which our enormous defense budget is supposed to provide us with. On the question of Ukraine and the question of Russia, again, we cannot simply rely on kit. We need to be doing things. The big question for us in Britain is, of course, how are we responding to the ambiguous warfare that we can see being propagated in the Ukraine? What kind of investments are we making in military intelligence? What kind of investments are we making in cyber? What kind of investments are we make in special forces? How much do we understand the situation on the ground in Ukraine and Russia? And to move to NATO, as I move towards the end, it's fine to talk about how important it is for us to be in NATO to have nuclear weapons, and indeed it is. But it's meaningless if we're not going to stick to the commitments that we made in Wales of 2% of GDP. The most important thing we can do to deter Russia at the moment is to ensure that Russia believes NATO is serious. NATO is serious about defending itself. If we say in a Wales summit that we're going to spend 2% of GDP, if we go around telling other countries to spend 2% of GDP, and we should be telling other countries to spend 2% of GDP, we must retain our own promise and commitment. Otherwise, again, the nuclear deterrent will not be taken seriously. Putin will look at us and ultimately conclude that there is a minimal chance of us doing anything if he was to intervene in the Baltic. Because at the moment, if you look even at the rapid reaction force commitments, the framework nations, Germany, France and Britain, appear to be struggling to commit in 2016 to maintain a deployable brigade. It seems to be very difficult to get the countries to really work out how that is going to be funded in 2016. At the same time, while Russia can deploy 40,000 troops at 72 hours notice, the NATO deployment rates are running at about six months. And if we don't reach out to the public, this is why this debate is important, if we don't talk about why Britain's a global power, why we care about the Baltic, why we care about the global order, why we set up NATO, why we have nuclear weapons in the first place, all of this will be lost. So to conclude, the fundamental protection, the fundamental rationale for all of this depends on something that honourable member opposite of myself disagree on. This is the nub of the disagreement. Do we believe in a world order? Do we believe in NATO? Do we believe Britain is a global power? Do we wish to play a role in the world? If we do, I personally will be voting in favour of these weapons. But the deterrent will not make sense unless the character of the nation is in place. Otherwise, what we will be doing is creating something a little bit like that gold ink stand on the desk. A pinnacle, a golden pinnacle on top of a cathedral when the foundations and the structure of that cathedral are lacking and the faith of the nation has been lost.